All right, it looks like everyone who is in the waiting room has joined, so we will start our presentation. Again, thank you for joining us today. This is the virtual MS information session along with a student panel for the Masters in Mechanical Engineering here at CU Boulder. So I first like to start off with a land acknowledgement. So the University of Colorado Boulder, Colorado's flagship university, honors and recognizes the many contributions of indigenous peoples in our state. And we acknowledge that it's located on the traditional territories and ancestral homelands of the Cheyenne, Arapaho, U, and many other Native American nations. And their forced removal from these territories has caused devastating and lasting impacts. And while the University of Colorado Boulder can never undo or rectify the devastation wrought on Indigenous peoples, we commit to improving and enhancing engagement with Indigenous peoples and issues locally and globally. This is super important to me and our program and our department, and as well as you can see, CU Boulder as a larger university entity. And I encourage all of you to think about if you do join us at CU Boulder in the Master's Mechanical Engineering program, how individually you can help um, this land acknowledgement be more of an action oriented goal and not just an acknowledgement, but actually putting um, some engineering, um, you know, approaches to this dedication to enhancing engagement and even improving that engagement with our um, Native American populations. So now we're gonna move into our agenda. So we're gonna first just introduce you quickly to our presenters. You'll meet them a little bit later on during the student panel. And then I wanna give you more about information of the city, the mechanical engineering program, and then the University of Colorado Boulder, or like we call it CU. And then we're gonna to get to know a little bit about you all. We're gonna give you a poll just to get to know who's here um, and who's attending and where you're attending from. And then we're going to go into the application process, especially talking about this spring 2025 cycle that's ending here pretty next week for international students and a few weeks for domestic students. So we'll address that. And then we'll talk about the different tracks and potential paths that you can take in our program. And then we'll give you some important contacts if you have any further questions after this presentation. And then we'll go into the most exciting part of this presentation, I think, which is our student panel, where we'll have slated questions for some of our current students, and they'll answer those as well as we'll give you all the opportunity to ask your own questions. Um, and if you don't have any questions, that's okay. We have enough to get through the day today. So we're slated for an hour. If you need to leave early or anything, this again is being recorded and it will be uploaded to our events website. And I'll send that a little bit later. Um, in the chat. So just be aware that if you miss anything, you'll be able to view this later on. So these are our presenters. So again, my name is Megan Vara. I am the Senior Graduate Program Specialist in the department. Very fancy title, pretty much. It just means that I am the admissions representative and I'm also the academic advisor for our master's students. So I help you through application if you're admitted. And then hopefully when you join us at CU, I become your academic advisor, which is really cool for me to see the progression of all my students um, go through that process. And I really enjoy it. We also have our graduate student ambassadors, Ryan Nelson and Hadi Hasbini. Their emails are up on this slide. Please feel free to reach out to them with any questions about the student experience. They are Their job is to talk to you all about the program, give them your um, their insight about Boulder, about what the program's like, about classes, the faculty, um, even the staff like me. So please feel free to email them and you can actually book a Zoom appointment with them. And even if you're a domestic or local student in Boulder, you can actually take a tour with them, which is really great. And then we also have our mechanical engineering MS graduate committee representative. Very long title again, but what that means is Carlotta Serrano sits on our graduate committee that's comprised of our faculty, staff like me, and then we do have student representatives who give us their insight about student issues, student policies that are affecting them, and then they can bring it to our committee that makes change for that and makes um, policies and even award scholarships and many other things. So Carla is also here with us today. And again, they'll introduce themselves when we start the student panel. So you get to know them really well throughout this presentation. So then we're gonna introduce you to hopefully your new home, which would be Boulder, Colorado. We are a population about 115,000. So it's a very college town. Everything really revolves around the college. And it's really nice to have that community aspect here. 
We do have 300 days of sunshine, so I know a lot of people think of Colorado as a snowy state, and it does snow, but honestly, it usually melts off by noon, and you get to go outside and go on hikes. I have here climbing, skiing, snowboarding. Um, so there's a lot of really great opportunities because you get the winter sports and the winter experience. But then later in the day, it's back to 50 degrees and really warm, which is one of my favorite parts about the state and just the city of Boulder in general. And then we are also ranked number 10 in the best places to live in the United States. So top 10 in the entire nation. There's two other um, cities in Colorado just in general as well, so you can tell that it's a really just great place to come and then also to stay after graduation. We are also top 10 in the most future ready cities globally, so top 10 in the entire world. And pretty much what this means is Thought Lab Group did a qualitative and quantitative study to examine the impact of technology on companies, cities, industries, and business performance. So really the um, takeaway from this is that our city of Boulder means that there's a lot of tech opportunities. There's a lot of companies coming to Boulder to develop that technology, develop the city to be more modern and most future ready. We're also a 30 minute drive to Denver, which is our capital city in Colorado. So a lot of students over the weekends will get out of Boulder. They'll take the bus that's free to students all the way down to Denver, which is only 30 minutes, like I said, and get a whole new experience, which is super nice. Also near and around Boulder, we have four national resource labs. So these are really um, interesting and unique to Boulder and the university because students can find internships, research opportunities, and even industry connections with this proximity of these national resource labs. A lot of our faculty work with these labs. And I know, again, a lot of students get internships here and then jobs straight after. So if you're interested in research in a national resource lab, these are really great opportunities. And again, something that's super unique to University of Colorado Boulder. And not many other universities can say they have so many national resource labs near them. Um, we also have the National Renewable Energy Laboratory, and that's in Golden. So that's only about a 20 minute drive from Boulder. So even though the other three are in Boulder or near Boulder, Golden, Colorado also has one near as well. So that's really great. And if you have a focus on air quality, clean technology, energy and environment, that's a really great national resource lab for you as well. So another home that would be called for you when you come here is the university. We are the top 6% among world universities, according to the academic rankings of world universities. We are also the top three town for entrepreneurs. And the reason I put this in the university part and not the Boulder part is because over 93 new companies have been founded based on CU Boulder technology since 1994. So the town is ranked so high in top three because of the patents and technology that come out of CU Boulder from our faculty and from our students. If you ever visit us or even when you come here down our mechanical engineering hallway, we have framed pictures of all the companies founded by ME faculty, alumni, and I want to tell you there's like two dozen of them. So if you are really interested in not only being a mechanical engineer, but also having an entrepreneurship focus, there is that option for you as well. And there's a lot of really great resources for that too. And then just to give you an idea of our population, we have about 35,000 students and about 6,500 of those are our graduate students. Another really great shot of our campus here, but we are also a top five university for startup creation. Again, I kind of just talked about that patent technology that we have, which makes us also top 15 for recent patent activity. So we have a resource on campus called the New Venture Challenge, and they're really, really great about helping students get connected to legal um, references. They're really great about telling students how to start a business. So we do have those resources for students who will make something as a mechanical engineer, make a product, and then be able to actually give it to a consumer. Maybe Carlotta can talk a little bit about that too. Our uh, thesis focuses a little bit on that, the consumer side of it. So the last um, part about the university here, and it's a very beautiful snow picture here, we have a five Nobel Prize winners, and we also have five National Medal of Science winners, and you can actually go and see those. They're in a museum on campus, which is really great. We are also the top 50 university in National Science Foundation research. If you don't know anything about that, 
pretty much that's where our grants come from. So all of our faculty will apply for NSF um, research funds. And then what that does is allow our students to also be involved in research, get paid for being a lab assistant, anything like that. And then we're also the number one public university recipient of NASA research awards. So I know this is mechanical engineering and not aerospace, but our department is very interdisciplinary and a lot of our faculty and labs do get a lot of NASA research awards because they are so interdisciplinary. They can gain those grants with their research because even though mechanical is not specifically aero, we do a lot in that space still. Haha, <laughs> space, that was a good pun for me. <laughs> All right, and then your last home would be the mechanical engineering department. This is mostly like what students really gravitate towards, obviously, when you're a graduate student. When you're an undergrad, you're more focused on the university as a whole, right? You're probably still figuring out your major, but when you come to graduate school, you really are a part of the department, right? You're here for a short time as a master's student, most likely. And so being a part of the department is really like your base home and your identity. So I like to share our mission statement, which is pioneering scientific breakthroughs, launching innovative technologies, and educating creative engineers that will solve today's societal challenges by improving human health and promoting sustainability. And we do that through these three commitments, which is high impact research, addressing real world problems, active learning, and experiential engineering education. That's probably our hallmark of our department is this active learning and experiential hands-on education. I learned very quickly when I first started in the department to not ask my students when they have midterms because they're not really a thing. They usually just have projects um, due at the end of the semester. It's very hands-on. It's not based on exams or tests. So if you like that, if you learn way better as a hands-on learner, our department's a really good fit for you. And then we are also committed to an inclusive community that brings together students, faculty, staff, and alumni. I've been a part of a lot of universities, a lot of departments, a lot of colleges, and I will say our community building is really, really great in this department. And um, I can ask Carlotta and our other presenters about that too during our student panel, just to give you a better idea of what it looks like for the student as a community. And then just to give you um, an overview of like the size of our department. So we have about 65 faculty members that's growing every single year, about 140 PhD students and about 170 MS students. So that's the cohort you would be joining. If you're wondering about the spring or the fall cohort, you're usually looking at about a cohort of 15 to 20 if you're in the spring. And then if you're in the fall, we're looking at about 50 to 60. Um, we're growing it every year. So you'll be a part of a really um, good size cohort where you have enough resources, enough opportunities to network, but not too big that you're just a number, which is really, really great. We also have some really great labs and facilities in our department and just on campus. That's the perk also of being a, a being a part of a really large university is there's a lot of resources. So some labs and facilities that our students can use really well and like very frequently is the Integrated Teaching and Learning Lab and the Idea Forge. So they all have maker spaces. They have machine shops, manufacturing, prototyping. And again, if you take a tour with Ryan or Hadi, they can show you these, but we also have a virtual tour on our website um, to view these labs and facilities, which is really nice. You can just look at them online if you're really curious about what students can do and a lot of students will um, you know, take classes using these maker spaces and everything like that. So now I'm gonna move on to getting to know you all. So I'm gonna start a poll and it's just very simple, three questions. So it's where are you attending the session from today? What area is your undergraduate degree in? And what is your current student status? So if you all could answer that really quickly, it should be on your Zoom. Yep, there we go, people are getting in. So somewhere else in the US, majority outside of the US. Most of us are mechanical engineers. There is one other, shout out to you. <laughs> I am not a mechanical engineer, so I'm with you here. Yeah, lots of mechanical engineers. Okay, we have a really good split of what your current student status is. We have some undergraduates, a lot of students who aren't even students, they're just employed at industry and some others probably in that in-between um, category. So that's awesome. Okay, we got another another Department of Engineering. No one's joining us from Colorado. <laughs> it's 
All right. Awesome. Thank you so much. I think everyone's participated. This just gives me a really great idea of what I should talk about, how I should cater. Um, this presentation also gives our student presenters a little bit of an idea of what, they're, um, what they can talk about and address to you all. So that's really awesome. I'm going to share the results to all of you really quick. There you go. You can see all of the um, split here. No one's enrolled as a graduate student somewhere else, which is great news. We're all looking at CU Boulder. And yeah, it looks like me and the presenters are the only ones from Colorado. <laughs> All right. Thank you so much for participating in that. So now we're going to get into probably majority of what you're all interested in, which is like the admissions process and just about the application. So I like to be upfront first and foremost about our funding as a master's student. You are expected to secure your own financial support. Us as a master's program anywhere in CU and other master's programs across the nation do expect master's students to fund and um, cover your own tuition and fees. That is very expected, again, across everywhere. That's not uncommon. If that is a deal breaker for you, if you have to have funding as a part of your graduate student experience, I encourage you to consider applying to the PhD program where it is guaranteed that if you are admitted that you have funding for the entirety of your graduate school experience. Unfortunately, that's just not um, reality for the master's program. You're only here for two years. We can't um, you know, give everyone a TA or an RA position to fund your um, studies. So masters, you are expected to secure your own financial support. There are ways to supplement that though. We have scholarship opportunities in the department. And just so you all know, the professional MS program is not eligible for being a teaching assistant or a research assistant where your tuition is fully covered. Again, if that is a priority for you to get a full TA tuition remission appointment, apply to the PhD. We would love to see your application there. And if you're not accepted into the PhD program, we still can offer you evaluation for admission into the master's program. So again, if that's a deal breaker, please just consider applying for the PhD. Um, yes, Jack, correct. Thesis-based masters are eligible for TARA appointments. They are just very rare. Um, that's something that Carlotta can definitely speak to um, during the student panel. But yes, they are eligible. It's just rare because those opportunities are prioritized for our PhD students. So again, if that's a deal breaker, apply to the PhD is my usual suggestion. There's also the Office of Financial Aid for Loans and Federal Student Aid. So if you're a domestic student, you can still apply for FAFSA. You can still apply for federal Pell Grants. And then on our website, there's a tuition and fee rate sheet link. So it gives you the actual idea of how much it costs to attend CU Boulder as a master's student. Um, I can ask Ryan to send that link of the funding and fellowships website in the chat, or I can send it on um, later as well for you all. But that's just, again, upfront um, and just really suggesting that if you do need funding, that you apply to the PhD program. And we would still love to see your application and again, you're still eligible to even be evaluated for the master's program. All right, so our deadlines are coming up really soon for the spring 2025 cycle. So these are for the attendees that want to join us in January and start their studies in January. That is spring 2025. If you are an international applicant, your deadline is next Tuesday, October 1st at 10 p.m. Mountain Standard Time. Please make sure you're adhering to those times. That is really, really important um, because a lot of our students are international, especially that deadline. You are adhering to our time zone. So please just be aware of that. And then if you're a domestic US student or permanent resident, your deadline is October 15th at the same time as well. If you're applying for the fall cycle, your um, deadline is the same for both domestic and international students, that's February 1st. So you still have a while, um, but yeah, I wanna focus on the spring applicants and really, again, remind you that you need um, to submit your application by those deadlines. Thank you, Ryan, for sending the funding and fellowships link in the chat. Please look at that if you have any questions about funding, most of it's explained in there. All right, so if you're in this pool, of you know obviously applying you either haven't applied or you have applied so if you haven't applied these are the materials that you need to have ready to go and submitted by that deadline so the first thing is the application that is through our graduate school admissions website 
We also have an application fee, $60 for domestic students, $80 for international students. If you are a domestic student, you do have options for fee waivers. But if you are an international student, there are limited fee waivers for international students for the master's program. Because again, if you're an international student, we expect you to fund your entire master's studies. So if you can't pay the application fee, we assume that you cannot pay for your master's degree. So again, if you're an international student and you cannot afford to fund your graduate school um, and your tuition, apply for the PhD. And then again, we can um, look at you for the master's degree program if you are not admitted into the PhD. You also need a CV and a resume um, and or you only have to upload one, so it's up to you, whichever one you choose to use or to submit. We also have a personal statement, so just you telling us why you want to come to CU Boulder. We also have an optional diversity statement. If you are interested in um, getting scholarships at time of admission, we definitely encourage you to submit a diversity statement. That information is in the application, so if you have any questions about that, it's on our website, but it's also in the application itself about what the diversity statement means, what it's asking for, and what you can share to be considered for an automatic scholarship at time of admission. We also need unofficial transcripts. You do not have to submit um, official transcripts unless you are admitted. We need two recommendation letters minimum. You can upload up to four, but it is not required. You only need two. And then if you're an international applicant, you do um, want to look at the English proficiency score el eligibility and see if you do need um, English proficiency scores. If you have applied, great, just keep checking your email, look into housing, Boulder area activities, and then definitely meet with me or I really encourage the um, ambassadors so that you can just talk to them, get to know the program, because if you're admitted, we want you to choose us and to be confident in that choice. So talk to the students who come here who have chosen CU Boulder and then also obviously listen to the panel. We'll talk about that a little bit. Um, but I also want to mention if you have any questions about the application process, these materials. We had a great session about two weeks ago called Creating a Strong MS Application, and that's recorded on our website. Um, I'll probably ask Ryan to send that link in the chat as well, just our events website, and you can watch that recording. It's about an hour long as well, and our graduate faculty chair, Davin Henze, talks about how you can make your application the strongest and the most competitive to be admitted. He talks about the personal statement, how you can explain your transcripts. He talks about recommendation letters, the diversity statement, all of that. So I highly recommend watching that video before submitting your application and making sure you're the most competitive to get admitted into our program. So this is the application and review timeline. Thank you, Ryan, for sending that. Um, so if you're applying for spring 2025, our application review will be in October and November. We only start review after the deadline passes, and we will only be able to review your application as long as you have all of your materials in. So a lot of students will submit their application without paying, without having all their recommendation letters in. That is completely okay. Just make sure to, that you know that we cannot review you until everything is received. Um, so if you're worried about getting your recommendation letters in by that October 1st or October 15th deadline, that's completely fine. Just make sure to hit the submit application button before that deadline, and then you'll have about five to 10 days to get all those um, other materials in. You'll get an email about that. So please just keep an eye out on your emails for that information. But again, just know we can't review you until all of your materials are in. And then we're hoping to get admission offers out in November. And then your decision deadline to tell us if you're coming or not is in mid-December. For fall 2025, our application review starts in February and March, again, after that deadline. And as long as you have all of your materials in, our admission and denial offers go out February to mid-March. And then we also have an on-campus visit day for admitted students in late March. So since our fall cohort is a lot larger, we have a whole day where you can come and visit, We'll have a faculty panel, we'll have class shadows. It's a really great event. I really highly recommend that if you are admitted for fall that you come and join us for that. And unfortunately, we don't have that for spring. It's too quick of a turnaround um, to get you here, but you'll be here soon enough in January if you're admitted and you decide to come here. And then if you're a fall applicant and you're admitted, you just need to let us know if you're coming by April 25th 
all of this would be in an admission letter to you by that time. All right, I'm going to go through the different um, degree plans that we have here. So every single one of you is going to only be able to apply to the MS professional degree. That is purposeful because if you are interested in the MS thesis degree, we cannot have you declare that before being admitted. So if you've ever looked at our website, you have seen that the thesis and professional focus areas are listed as they are on this slide. Just so you know, you can be a robotics and control professional degree focus area. So that means that if you're admitted as an MS professional, you can still focus your degree on the robotics and control focus area. It's just you adjusting your curriculum. There's no lock step in of um, how you put it on your transcripts, how you put it on your degree plan. It's just what classes you take kind of determine your focus. Most of our students end up just being a flex student. They take, they come in wanting to be a biomedical focus area and then they really like the design and materials aspect of it. So a lot of our students just end up falling into a flex and really broadening their interests and experiences. If you are interested in the MS thesis program, you first have to get an admission offer. That is the first step. You apply as a professional, and if you are admitted, then you can try and start finding a faculty advisor. I'll let Carlotta talk a little bit more about that in the student panel, but just know you cannot be directly admitted into the thesis program. If you are filling out your application, you do have the opportunity to also put your application in the um, review for the dual degree with engineering management program. So that is a master's of engineering in engineering management. And that program is intended for students who want a strong education, both like the technical and fundamental topics of mechanical engineering, but then also having some soft skills or some you know, actual um, skills that transfer to being a manager, to being a project engineer, and really becoming a leader in the industry as a manager. So if you're interested in that, please check that box on your application. If you do and you're admitted, you can completely decide that you don't want to do it. It's not, you know, locked in that you have to. It's just putting you in that pool to be considered for admission into the dual degree program. So I'm going to kind of go over what that um, degree plan looks like for all of these different pathways. So if you are an MS thesis student, you have to complete 30 credit hours, which is about 10 classes. Most of our students finish their degree in about two years or four semesters. You're all engineers, you can do the math, 10 courses within four semesters, you're looking at about two to three classes a semester. So that's usual for our students. As a thesis student, you have four required classes um, and a minimum of 18 out of these 30 have to be in mechanical engineering. One of my favorite parts of this department though in our program is that up to 12 credits or about four classes out of your 10 classes can be taken outside of mechanical engineering. I have a student right now taking an acting class. I have a student taking a dance class. And then I have a lot of students taking aerospace, computer science, um, engineering management, or even um, material science robotics classes. So it's a really great opportunity and something that I don't see at a lot of other master's mechanical engineering programs is they're pretty locked in. Um, you have to take a lot of certain classes. It's very much like undergrad where you don't have a lot of flexibility. So in our program, we really want you to get the money that you're paying worth and make sure that you can take the classes that you want. That's very similar to our professional requirements. So still 30 credit hours, but you actually only have one required class. So one out of 10 classes. And then the rest of the nine, you can choose exactly what you want to take. Again, at least six of those have to be mechanical engineering, but those other four classes or 12 credits can be anything as long as they're a graduate level class. So that's really, really awesome. A lot of our students who come in with a different undergraduate degree like aerospace or environmental engineering really enjoy that because they can still get experience from their undergraduate degree, which they really enjoyed but then kind of um, still delve deeper into mechanical engineering as a whole. And again, you don't have to even choose specific mechanical engineering courses. You have a lot of flexibility in the department of what classes you take. And we have a lot of different focus areas, as you saw, to choose from. 
And then we also have the dual degree that I spoke about with engineering management. As you can see, it's a little bit more because you are getting two MS degrees at the same time. So it is 45 credit hours, so about 15 more credits, which is about five more classes. So instead of 10 classes, you're looking at about 15. Um, so just, you know, setting expectations there. But 24 credits come from mechanical engineering. You are still allowed to take up to six of those credits outside of mechanical engineering. So again, an aerospace class, computer science, acting class, if you want. And then the other 21 credits is from um, engineering management. So you can see on this um, page that even engineering management program have a lot of requirements. They have a lot of specific classes you have to take. Um, but again, you have that flexibility in our department, which is really nice, even if you wanna do the dual degree. So these are your important contacts. If you have questions about requirements or your application, please email me. I am, you know, again, the admissions representative. I just sent my email in the chat. And then if you have questions about the student experience, again, if you submitted your application or once you're waiting for your decision to come back after you've submitted your application, please talk to our student ambassadors. They're the ones in the program. I cannot speak to you about the engineer content or the curriculum. Um, so it's really nice that you can talk to them and again, take a tour with them, hopefully. So please um, reach out to them if you have any questions and Ryan can send his email in the chat. Again, even though it's on the slides, you can completely take it from there or from the recording after we're done here. It's also on our website on the contact us page. Um, Thomas had a question really quick. Do you limit the number of students who can choose each of the MS professional specialty options? No, we don't have a quota or anything like that. You really just um, in your application, you do or you can choose a focus area, but that's not locked in. So if you put on your application that you're a biomedical option or focus area, you are not kept to that. You can just come to me and say, hey, I'm going to take robotics classes, actually. And I'm going to say, great. Are you meeting those 30 credit minimums? And you'll just take those certain classes. So there's not a limit. Um, it's more of the limit of like class sizes, mostly than anything. All right, we have a really great question um, in the chat for the student panel, which is exactly what we're going to move on to. Um, so I'm going to stop sharing and then I'm going to highlight and spotlight our two um, student panelists. I'm going to ask them to turn their camera on. All right, here we go. Let me spotlight you two. Okay, spotlight Ryan. Where's Carlotta? There you are. Hello. Alrighty, so we're going to start our student panel portion again. Um, we have slated questions, so I'm going to ask them a few questions. We have one really great one in the chat that is also on our slated questions. Um, but first, I'm going to ask them to introduce themselves. So Ryan, can you introduce yourself really quick? Hi, my name is Ryan and um, yeah, I'm an energy and environment fo focus here at CU Boulder. Um, I'm a bachelor's accelerated master's student. so. Um, I did my undergrad here at CU in environmental engineering and switched over to um, mechanical engineering as a master's student to put more focus into uh, energy. Great. Thank you. Go ahead, Carlotta. Hello, everyone. My name is Carlota. I'm originally from Spain. I'm doing my master's thesis here at CU Boulder in the design track. So I'm also taking courses that are focused in design. And I'm doing research with Grace Burleson, and we study how to develop products that are more suitable to the environment and to the end user. So if you have any questions related to the design track or master thesis, master professional, I've gone through both of them. <laughs> Yes, she. we have a really good diversity here. Bachelor student who decided to stay and then this international student who came and then, you know, switched to the thesis program. So a lot of really great experience here. So we're just going to start off with the first question. Um, Carlotta can really speak to this one, but what was your experience with the application process? Do you have any tips? Um, there's also one in the Q&A asking about if there's a need to contact professors for um, assistantships or anything like that. So if you could talk about that too. Let me read the chat. Um, it's in the Q&A, but I can copy it. Oh, okay, it that too. Yeah, I would say that uh, one of my tips for when you're applying is to not be worried so much about your grades, because when I was applying, I was like, oh my gosh, I come, my background is in aerospace and I was applying for a mechanical engineering master program. And in Spain, the grades work 
different. It's not uh, an A or a B you have from one to 10. And uh, because I was in the aerospace department, my grades weren't as high as other departments. So I was very worried that my grades wouldn't let me get into the uh, program. And I feel like you shouldn't be focusing that much or worrying that much about the grades that you have, but more about the motivation that you show on your personal statement and how you uh, tell the department the contributions you're gonna bring to um, the mechanical engineering masters or uh, PhD, how uh, you're excited and how your skills can make a great contribution to the community and to CU Boulder. So uh, just don't worry so much about the grades or um, maybe if you don't have a great English, great English skills, that's also okay as long as you show your passion and how motivated you are. And then um, also, uh, let's see, let's read what you just said. Applying to mechanical masters in international student, is there need to contact professors for assistantship? Okay, so I when I was applying, I really wanted to get my master's funded, uh, but it is very difficult to find professors or uh, just try to reach out to them. I, I sent a lot of emails, but many of them weren't replying because they have a lot of things going on as well. So don't stress out if you don't receive any answer. That doesn't mean that they don't care about uh, what you're saying or uh, it's just that it takes a little bit um, longer. So I would suggest to still reach out to as many advisors as you uh, can if you're interested in, the, in their research, but if you don't get any answers, that's okay. Just apply to MS Professional. And once you're here, you can go talk to them in person, go to their offices and show your interest. And maybe if they have any opportunities, then you can change to MS Thesis. But um, yeah, just try to reach out as to as many advisors as possible, but don't uh, feel overwhelmed or sad if they don't reach back uh, because they have a lot of things going on. It's easier to do it in person. Yeah, yeah, great advice. And as far as the automatic scholarship goes, if you fill out, again, the diversity statement, and again, that's on the application about specifically how you can get an automatic scholarship or what eligibility you have to meet, it's all in that application. So you have to open it, go to the diversity statement to see those eligibilities. That's also, again, on our website. Um, but I definitely emphasize what Carlotta said. And again, I would recommend to wait until you get an admission offer or your admission letter until or before reaching out, because if you're reaching out and you're not admitted yet, what happens if you weren't admitted, right? You know, our admission rates are really good. They're about 80% average, but just wait until you're admitted so the faculty members know that you are coming to CU Boulder and that they can dedicate themselves because you're also dedicated to coming to CU. All yeah. right. Sorry, um, let's, I, no. <laughs> I did do that uh, after I got admitted, so that's a good point. And um, I was going to say something else, but I forgot, so let's just keep going. <laughs> It'll come back, I'm sure. Yeah. <laughs> um, so this is this is something that we're kind of already talking about, but Ryan, can you talk about what your experience with funding your studies is, and do you have any suggestions for students and how to pay for school? And that's number four on our sheet. Yeah, so as Megan said, the master's program is fully self-funded, um, and I've personally had um, no issues, but I think some advice that I'd give to a lot of people is like, like they said, um, there's in the fellow, the funding and fellowships link, um, there's a lot of like scholarship opportunities, um, even though that may not pay for your entire um, master's program. Um, that's one option. Then another option is there's um, plenty of opportunities that the school offers for um, jobs and then also in the surrounding areas to be able to work at the same time as getting your master's to help fund um, part of that. Um, I also want to add to that, that even though the master's professional might sound like a lot of money and a lot of people might be struggling, paying for that, or might be worried about um, how to fund this master's. I I found this master's super useful. All the courses that I've taken have helped me found uh, have helped me find um, a job job opportunities and internships that uh, 
have made this process a lot easier. So uh, all the courses you're taking are gonna be very helpful and companies really appreciate when uh, people have, uh, have masters or PhD uh, because they have more knowledge. So, and you get paid more. So even though at the beginning it might be a big investment, then it's easier to find jobs and uh, the opportunities you're gonna get are better. So if you're thinking in staying long-term in the US or uh, developing yourself here, I feel like master is a great opportunity to get your step into that industry. Yeah, Carla, that's a really great point. Our return on investment is really, really big for master's degrees. I have so many students who are applying or they come into the program and say that the reason that they're coming and getting their master's degree is because of the fact that their tuition that's getting that they're paying for is going to come back in not even less than five years um, in a job promotion or a job raise or anything like that um, on our website that I just sent in the chat we actually have the number which is about $9,500 average per year that you make more when you have a master's degree so it's a lot of money up front again there's scholarships we send out scholarships to our students I think like almost at least twice a week Carlotta Ryan you probably know um, just random ones that we hear so it's not just only our department scholarships that students fund their studies with but outside ones that we get um, notified of through donor offices and everything like that. So if it's not our department giving you a scholarship, it's someone else that you can apply for too. Um, okay, we'll ask one more of our slated questions and then we'll open it up. But I really like this question and um, we'll address the housing question you know, after this. But I wanna know what was your favorite class that you've taken at CU Boulder? And Carlotta, you can go first. Mm -hmm. Um, I really liked advanced product design. It's one of the courses in the design track. Uh, first of all, the professor James Harper was amazing. Overall, all the professors I've had are really good teachers and uh, very friendly. Uh, I feel like they're very professional and they know how to teach the, uh, their curriculum in a very uh, comprehensive way, very collaborative environment. I really like that. Uh, the courses, advanced product design, for example, I was surprised by how many guest lectures we would have. And I love that because every now and then people who had specific skills would come and talk about it. And that made it like easier to keep yourself involved because there were there was always someone else coming into the room and talking and explaining new things. And then also advanced product design basically is a course that helps you understand all the entire design process from um, brainstorming and ideation to prototyping and iteration of your product. And you go through through your use series and you test your prototype and you have, as Megan said, all these different um, resources from the university where you can have like the welding uh, workshop, the, um, the 3D printers. Uh, there are many resources that the university gives you so that you can develop your prototypes. And I thought it was a really cool class because you have, you can be very creative, you can be very innovative and you always work with people, which is how you work in an, in an industry environment. You will always have to be working and collaborating with uh, your team. So this really helped me uh, increase those soft skills and also uh, be good in a, uh, as a team. And I really like the way that you can, it's a lot more hands-on rather than just doing exams and um, exercises. So yeah, that was definitely my favorite. Uh, yeah, my favorite is a class I'm actually currently in, um, which is called Renewable Energy and the Future of the Power Grid. Um, I find it very interesting because coming from an environmental background, um, I get kind of a different perspective, um, especially in the mechanical department, um, on like really what renewable energy is and like how it can help our future. And then also, um, I find the master's classes are really, and specifically this class is like helping me get a really deep understanding of renewable energy. And really that's what I was looking for coming into this master's program. So I think that class is super interesting. And um, we are doing 
literature reviews, and then also a final project um, where we're really developing our like uh, kind of a a project to help the power grid in the future, um, which is pretty interesting and something that I'm really interested in. I love hearing those. And I learned so much about the courses as their advisor when I hear those. So thanks for giving me some things to talk about in my appointments. <laughs> um, so yeah, now we'll kind of open it up. So I've been seeing some questions um, come in, but please feel free to send them in the Q&A or in the chat. But we'll start off with one June's question. So Ryan, could you paint a picture of the housing situation around campus? And do you have a realistic number I should be looking for a monthly rent? I know it depends based on if you want roommates, if you want a single apartment, but can you just talk about your experience in that? Yeah, I would say being here for five years, I have a pretty good understanding of the rent in Boulder. Um, to start off, um, CU does offer grad housing, but it's very limited and hard to get. Um, so you can't apply for that. But um, I've lived off campus now for five years um, here in Boulder. And it is expensive, but I think there are also ways that you can make it cheaper, um, finding roommates. And then there's also cheaper places around Boulder. Um, I would say I, I can't give you an average number of rent, but maybe like a thousand a month is what I would say. Maybe that's maybe realistic if you have a few roommates. Um, it could be more, it could be less than that. But there's a lot of housing. And even though it's overwhelming because there's a lot of students in Boulder, um, I know everyone always finds housing, um, whether it's a walk to campus or a bus ride um, or even a bike ride away. It's pretty simple. Yeah, I would like to add to that that um, for me, the first year uh, of trying to find housing, uh, it really helped me go through um, Facebook. So there is like a group in Facebook that you can um, join and there are a lot of people looking for roommates and usually those are uh, cheaper options as well as if you go to Ralphie's list, uh, uh, I don't know if someone can put the link to Rolf's list, but those are all uh, really good affordable uh, housing options that you can look into where you can find roommates or um, you can find people who already have a house and you can just join their house. I was, I was really looking into not paying more than $700 uh, per month. And I, was able to find an option, even though I had to live with four more people. But if you are really wanting to find kind of like the cheaper housing, you can do so and it's possible. It's just that you might have to give up on some other things like sharing the space with more people. Um, and also Boulder has a great transportation system. Uh, you have the B cycles that are free for all students. So you can take them. And uh, if your house is a little bit farther away, you can just use those or you can take the bus, which is also for free for students. And um, even though house, graduate housing is difficult to get, uh, I was able to get it this year, for example. I'm right now in the graduate housing. So I feel like that's also... It's difficult to get the first year, but if you go in person and try like to talk to the office and apply early enough, you might be able to get it. And this graduate housing is around $800 to $900 per month sharing and just sharing with one more person, for example. So there are good options. You just have to keep looking and be patient because uh, it takes a some time and don't be worried if you cannot find housing until like very the end because there's always people looking for roommates so there will be always housing available it's just uh how much you're willing to pay and how far you want to be so yeah yes very very good advice um and i will even say i live 10 minutes outside of boulder and my rent is very, very cheap. And so it's like kind of your priorities. Like if your priority is to live near campus where you can walk, then expect your rent to be a little bit higher. But if you're okay with taking the bus into Boulder or being away from like the city center or what we call Boulder proper, then your rent gets a little bit cheaper. And there's plenty of communities right around Boulder. I grew up here um, that I know that is like options for students. And then we sent those links in the chat for you um, as well. So yeah, great question. 
Um, also, so, sorry. Yeah, One more ahead. thing I want to add uh, is that there are different areas around the university. So one thing that I was told is that there is a part that is called the Hill, and that's where all the undergrad um well, not housing, but um, how is it called? The sororities and fraternities are. So if you're more of a, a chill person that likes to have like a more silent space, I would not recommend going to the Hill because usually there is a lot of like parties and undergrads going on there. So uh, just to keep it in mind. <laughs> that is a great recommendation. <laughs> That's why I do not live in Boulder. Um, <laughs> so yeah, we have another question in the chat, which I can answer, but I also am going to hand off to Carla just to see if she has any insight. But applying from a different engineering undergrad, the mechanical engineering, does coming from a different background help hurt my chances of getting admitted? It doesn't necessarily help or hurt. Um, we review applications holistically and individually. So depending on the person, we you know, admit based on that. We don't admit just based on your undergrad degree. Like Carla said, we don't admit just based on your GPA. We really look at everything and weight it completely the same. So if you have a different undergraduate degree than mechanical engineering, tell us about that in your personal statement. Why mechanical engineering? Like, why did you make this switch? Why see you Boulder? Um, and that's completely fine. Usually, if you're still in the engineering realm, you're, you have the foundational skills, you have the understanding, and our faculty know that as well. Maybe Carlotta and Ryan can even talk about that too, is like our faculty in the grad program know that we're all coming from different foundational skills and places and degrees. So they try to like make it as easy as possible. So if you're admitted, our faculty know that you have some sort of foundational skills to apply to the classes. So yeah, I'll hand it off to either Carlotta or Ryan because they both don't have a degree in mechanical engineering from undergrad. Yeah. I would say that's very common, honestly. Not everyone comes to uh, a mechanical engineering undergrad and it's totally fine um, as long as you like show your motivation again and say the reasons why you've changed, why you want to pursue, to pursue uh, the master's in mechanical engineering and what things you can bring to the uh, to the Sea of Boulder community. Um, I also uh, think that, um, I was gonna say something I forgot. Um, uh, <laughs> it's okay, okay yeah. uh, Ryan, <laughs> yeah. you can go talk, I'll think about it. I don't know what's happening to, to me today. <laughs> it's Friday morning. <laughs> yeah, no worries. Yeah, I would say the same thing uh, as Carlotta just said. Um, a lot of students I know in all, pretty much all my classes are not, I mean, I would say a decent majority of them are not mechanical um, undergrads. And I have no issue. And I know a lot of other students have no issue um, really like fitting in really into those program or into those classes um, with the material. Um, you know, some people may have to do a little bit of extra work. Um, for example, I didn't come from as much of like a, a coding background undergrad. And even though mechanical is not super like coding heavy, um, there is more coding in mechanical engineering than environmental engineering. Um, just certain things that I had to like adapt and still learning on, um, which is one of the reasons why I wanted to do mechanical engineering and build my skills. Yeah. Uh, I just remember what I was going to say, uh, that even though you come from a different undergrad, there are these required courses that uh, the master makes you take so that uh, you, they make sure that we're both in the same, we're all in the same track. And there is always, like, people here are very friendly. You will always make a group of friends that you can work with. It's, it's okay if you need help doing your homework or you meet with other um, mechanical engineers to uh, work on your homework, that's totally fine um, as long as you don't copy. <laughs> but um, yeah, there is always a lot of collaboration and the, um, the, the mechanical engineering department has a lot of study room areas where you can gather all together and just help each other out and there are always a lot of office hours. So the professors are always very helpful in case you have any questions as well. So I would say to not worry if you come from any other background because they will make things easy for you if you have any um, struggles. 
Yeah. And again, if you're admitted, we're confident in you and your abilities. Like you won't get admitted if we don't believe that you can be successful in our program. Um, so yeah, we have about four minutes left. I don't see any other questions, but I, I kind of want to go to that part of the community. So um, Carlotta, could you start off just talking about like the culture and the community of our department specifically and how you felt welcomed or if you did it or any of those experiences? Yeah, so I'm an international student. Uh, so I really, when I came here, I was like, I don't want to meet any Spanish people. I just want to like get involved with all these other different cultures. There is a lot of international people as well here. So um, I just feel like the mechanical engineering community uh, was really welcoming. They put a lot of effort into having all these events so that we get to know each other and we have some time to chat uh, apart from like going to classes and getting to know each other in class. But you also have some social activities. We have some bowling events where you uh, go and play bowling and it's always very fun, a lot of free food. So it's always a really fun time. And I've always felt that I'm a person that asks so many questions because I always have so many doubts. So uh, Megan, she's been great at answering all of those questions. And if you ever feel like uh, you don't understand something well about the program or about uh, the application process, feel free to reach out to any of us because we will always um, welcome you and try to help you as much as possible. Uh, so I feel like, yeah, the community here at CU Boulder, it's very open-minded, very welcoming. I really like that um, everyone is very active uh, because we have the mountains, We people are very energetic and they like to do a lot of sports. So that also helped me like even improve my health <laughs> by doing more outdoor activities. And um, yeah, overall, I'm very happy here at CU Boulder and I really recommend everyone coming, especially um, I really encourage females to come to the uh, master program because I haven't seen a lot of at least in the design focus track. Uh, I've, I've gone to many classes where it's only me or just a couple more girls and um, it's sad but also I want to encourage everyone females and males but uh, females to not be disencouraged by maybe how hard it might be or um, this gender inequality i i really i've been treated super well and i love working uh with all my teammates but i really would love to see more girls in the master program because it's always very fun and um yeah i every i always encourage everyone to all the girls to do engineering so <laughs> yeah um yeah on that i um, kind of on what Carlotta said, I would say the ME program is a very tight knit community, um, especially just like even how big our school is. I know it's not the biggest school in the United States, but it's still 35,000 people. I would say the engineering school feels very small. And then when we get into our specific program, it's a very, it's a small cohort of people where I know a lot of different people. I'm able to ask people for help and kind of hang out with people outside of school, which is super fun. And then um, I'm constantly getting notifications on my phone of like different seminars to go to, career fairs, um, community building events um, for the engineering program and ME program specifically, which is super cool. And that's like, I could say from my undergrad to my graduate here, um, the mechanical engineering program does a really, really good job of like outreach to students where I'm in my undergrad, I wasn't getting all those notifications um, to do things and community building. Um, but in the mechanical engineering department uh, specifically, I feel like I've really, there's been a step up in that and I've definitely appreciated it. All right, great. Thank you guys so much. Um, it is 10 a.m. So I want to be respectful of everyone's time here. Um, and that this was slated only for an hour. So again, this is recorded. So it will be uploaded to our website. Um, it is in the chat. I can send it one more time, but please um look out for it. And then again, if you are applying for spring 2025, we'll see your application soon. 
And just one more note on the uh, graduate student events page, our open house, which is kind of like a, um, you know, introduction to our program. If you're a domestic student, you're completely welcome to join if you're an international student as well. It is an on-campus only event that's going to be on Friday, November 22nd. We would love to see you all there. Carlotta and Ryan will be there um, as well as me. And it's also for students who are interested in MS and or PhD. So if you're unsure, please come and hang out with us at our open house. And Sign up for all of the rest of our events and hopefully we'll see your application. Please reach out with any questions, but thank you for joining us today. And thank you to our wonderful presenters, Ryan and Carlotta. Thank you guys. Yeah. All right, bye everyone. Thank you. Bye, have a good day.